Welcome to the Harper's Podcast. I'm your host, Violet Luca. In this episode, I'm joined by author Atessa Moshfeg to discuss her latest novel, Latvona. Set during the Middle Ages, the story explores the bleak existence of Latvona's residents, who are subject to rigid hierarchies imposed by Christianity and their village's highly fallible ruling class. Though the narrative frequently shifts between characters, the excerpt from Lepona that appears in the June issue of Harper's Magazine focuses on an encounter between two of them who destabilize this order. Marek, the hideous son of a sheep herder whose nasty, brutish, and short life has been raked by violence, and Ina, a blind witch who served as wet nurse for the entire village. I spoke with Moshveg about her process, bodies, and her forays into screenwriting. You know, you've written in a variety of genres, including a psychological thriller, a mystery, and now your latest novel, uh, Lapvona, which could be described as fantastical. Lapvona is set in, let's say, post-collapse of the Western Roman Empire. There's, it's kind of Middle Ages. It's, it's vague about, you know, there's not a definite time period in which this occurs. However, you can get a sense so why did you choose to set the story in this particular milieu? I guess I, I chose to set Lapvona in Lapvona because it really seemed like, for me personally, the most interesting setting for the story I wanted to tell. I started writing with a specific story idea which is rare for me. Usually I come to a story with a voice or a character or a place or a situation. Um, in this case, I really wanted to get at this thing that had been bugging me, which was a scenario, a premise, in which a boy kills the son of another family and then as punishment uh, or retribution or an act of justice, that family in mourning takes that boy in as a replacement son. Mm. And I had been kicking around different ideas about how that might transpire in different worlds, different communities, societies, whatever. But when I started to really sort of brainstorm and think about what this place needed to feel like, what restrictions were in place, and really started imagining the circumstances in which that might come about, I needed a place that felt, first of all, for me, distanced enough from contemporary society that I felt like I could take liberties to stretch what would be expected. And that led me to thinking about dynamics of power in a society and who makes the rules. I started thinking about lawlessness. And then I started thinking about my own ancestral background a story my mother, who is from Croatia, likes to tell is that we are descendant from pirates. So I was sort of looking into that, like, okay, who were the pirates on the Adriatic? And I, I did a little research. I emailed this professor of Croatian history, who I think was in Australia, and uh, asked if he would share a PDF of a book that he had written that I couldn't find and he did, and it sort of sent me into that era of what I guess is the late Middle Ages. And I started making notes. I started sort of following some breadcrumbs and research, and it just became like extremely interesting to me to set this story in a fiefdom of some like you know long forgotten place that had some vague relevance to my own uh, ancestral background, perhaps. A place on which I could project some of the contemporary themes that I was observing and grappling with. And this was 2020 during lockdown. 
And maybe uh, the Black Plague sort of hinted at that for me. Maybe that was a bit of what made it feel especially relevant. But um, no, it was really just sort of a letting letting that place and time emerge through following my own curiosity. Yeah. Um, and I, what I also found really fascinating is that, you know, the particulars of Latvona, of this world, is, you know, the the natural world is really important in this just as much as, you know, sort of like the, the village, its customs, this uh, intense patriarchal system that's happening. Um, you know, were you conscious of creating a work with a clear sense of place in that regard and not, you know, not just um, sort of using it as a, a way to reflect or ruminate on things that are happening in the present? Absolutely. When when I imagined the landscape, I mean, what I really imagined was an agrarian society that emerged in a countryside out of nature. And I thought a lot about the relationship between humans and nature in that time. And, you know, when you're, when you're writing a novel and a character or characters fill a space, you really have to visualize that space. So there was a map of my mind of, of this area and there were mountains and hills, there were streams, there was a lake, there um, were farming allotments, there were wild places, there were forests of different kinds of trees. Um, and I did some research into, you know, what sort of plants grow in this particular region of Eastern Europe. I mean, I wasn't totally consistent or religious about um, being true to a specific natural environment. I was sort of building it um, as I went. And also the animals that live there. Because it's a story that I think was motivated by a mindset that I was not familiar with, which was, okay, I'm living through a pandemic and suddenly survival has taken on new meaning and a new depth in common consciousness or co the collective consciousness. Mm -hmm. So I thought about, you know, resources. Where are we, where are these people getting food? Where are they getting water? You know, where are they getting their health care? What are the governing principles of their belief system? Things like that. So the natural world is, you know, it's, that's the source. And, and yeah, so it became very important in how I imagined the lives of these characters. Yeah, I mean, it feels like, again, thinking of my own experience of the lockdown, if you lived in a city, the natural world was very, even further away from you than it normally would be. Again, because, you know, you're not supposed to travel, you're supposed to stay in one place. And, you know, globalization has made so many cities, including New York, uh, feel placeless or part of a universal place without individual character. And I guess, was that also on your mind while writing this novel? That's an interesting question. And I, and I think my answer is not really. Mm. Um, but, but, but maybe, because what, what my mind goes to is um, just the place that I was in. And the, the place that I was isolated in was this house. Um, I live in the foothills of Pasadena in a very shady glen. This is Southern California. Um, but weirdly, my the property and the properties around my house are strangely lush. Like I'm looking out my window and it looks like a jungle. <laughs> and I can barely see the sky. It's green. And my home is an unusual home. It is about 100 years old. It was built by like a single person for himself. He was an artist and, and a collector of 
objects and materials. And he built a lot of the house using found materials, much of which came from a church, I think in Santa Barbara, that had been destroyed in an earthquake. And I, I even have a mission bell um, on the roof, which I've never rung, but I stare at it <laughs> in the courtyard. Um, and there was something about the materials of the place and how dark and silent it was that made me feel a little bit like I'm living in a church environment. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of a spirit <laughs> roaming around <laughs> um, and no one is here to worship but me. Those kinds of things, <laughs> those kinds of things informed, I guess, my, my imagination. I mean, bit. that sort of leads to my next question where, you know, my year of rest and relaxation and Eileen are both narrated in the first person and are, you know, driven by the narrator's voices to a certain extent. While Lebrona, on the other hand, has this really zoomed out, uh, kind of almost biblical or fable-like quality to the narration. Um, is that, was that also informed by this, uh, where you were physically, emotionally at the time? I, I was definitely informed by where I was psychologically. I think that literature or all art, especially narrative art, can be very useful as a means of escaping one's situation. My whole reason for doing this i.e. writing novels, is to take my reader to a different place. And I really felt like I needed to be creating another place for myself because I couldn't leave my house. I also, because of the pandemic, had a shift in perspective, like I think everyone else on the planet. And it was more of a global perspective, um, and it did not feel interesting to me to inhabit the deep and dark psyche of whatever twisted character was going to lie at the center of my story. I really, really desperately wanted to be <laughs> with people. And I also thought that it would be, and this proved to be correct, a challenge to do that, to allow my story to be told through different points of view and to get very close to those points of view, to weave in and out of different perspectives, different consciousnesses, bodies, eyes, lenses, feelings, histories. I wanted to create a community of characters um, because I really thought that would be the best way to weave a sense of this world through their different experiences. And, you know, I can also say that I hadn't written a novel in a little while. I, I had been working on a longer project that I, I have yet to go back to that was definitely in the first person. And I'm very happy that it is. But I just felt moved to do something that wasn't all about thinking um, that wasn't so much an interior story, um, but something that would be more about the connections between people. You've been described as a writer interested in the grotesque. Do you feel that's accurate? And, and if so, where does that interest come from for you? Okay. I'm definitely interested in the grotesque but I can't really tolerate it in other people's work. <laughs> so it's a bit of a selfish thing. Um, and when I'm writing, I never think that what I'm doing is grotesque. Even in the revision, it wasn't until uh, like two weeks ago, I went into a recording studio to record the audiobook of Lapvona. And there were passages mm. what, that I found really difficult to read. It's like, whoa, this is really mm. disturbing. Um, like, this is actually really uncomfortable. Like, should I not say this out loud? Maybe that's just proof of my sensitivity 
which is what find what I find so fascinating about that kind of stuff. Maybe in the past, I thought that what is grotesque is is sort of a way of disturbing people out of their comfort zones and into a way of reading where they're experiencing the story on a more visceral level. And um, maybe that's true about Lepvona too. I don't know. I just don't know how to write about characters without writing about their physicalities. And I just think being a human, we do so much to dress things up and cover things up and look good and like we're not human flesh, especially now in the Kim Kardashian internet (laughs) filtered whatever movement but for me I feel like I need to acknowledge that the like I need to acknowledge that like yes I I sweat and bleed and um sleep and fart and drool like all of those things because I'm a human being you know (laughs) like let 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 me not forget that I'm a human being. Um, that's what grounds me in my life and on the planet, and is also a way that I um, find I have compassion and empathy for other human beings. That we're not just these, we're not just um, personalities. You know, like we are all members of the same tribe. And mm. ha- we're having a human experience that isn't all like that we're experiencing on so many levels, but on the physical plane, that's that's really foundational for me. And especially in fiction, the the physical experience that a character is having can say so much. I mean, what else is there? Thoughts and feelings. And those can be so much harder to describe. Right. And I think the setup of the book, the conceit that sort of generated the book, um, and just so much in this world of Lepvona is so, it so tightly adheres to the patriarchy to the point where, you know, sometimes it makes no sense, you know, where there's, you know, the social order is maintained through violence and religion, religion being, you know, the, you know, God being the father Jesus be I mean there's never there's never a mention of Jesus but there's still many mentions of God and this you know that is so important and then of course it, you know the importance of male heirs who do not mm-hmm. physically or mentally resemble their fathers and are actually kind of interchangeable in in a way that undermines the foundation of the family did you think of it in those terms of sort of like dissecting yeah the patriarchy i guess I guess I wouldn't have said that's what I was thinking, but it just seemed so intrinsic to that society um, and so important that it had to be part of the story. And it and it was also to my advantage as a storyteller to have a value system put in place that was sort of weird and that put a strain and pushed the story toward different plot elements, basically. But I think, yeah, the question of patriarchy and heirs and all that stuff, I mean, that doesn't feel that distant, actually. No. Um, and, I mean, I've, I've, I've thought about it. I think, I mean, it's, like, present all the time. You know, I didn't take my husband's last name, and there was a reason I didn't. Because that's not how I like. I don't want to identify with that. Um, I'm not born of that lineage, and I think about where my name comes from a lot, and my paternal grandfather, and the kind of patriarch he was. Well, I, I think one of my favorite characters. If I, you know, put a gun to my head, make a list of favorite characters. I, I was really interested in Ina. And particularly Mm -hmm. her mistrust of humanity, especially other adults. And, you know, her loss has led her to become an incredibly, like, pure character 
trusting only in the natural world. Why were you interested in this kind of Mary-like figure who could convene with nature, but also has this, uh, let's just say, uh, sexy side? Sexy? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> well here let, let's let's stick to the the convene with nature okay um i'm interested in how you think enid has a sexy <laughs> side um i can't tell you exactly what my line of thinking was um but you know i i, I started drafting the book and it seemed like the male characters were coming easily um, and then, you know, I, I knew that there were also women and um, I needed to create them. And I, th I was thinking about Marek, who's sort of the central character, who's an adolescent boy. Um, and I really sort of aligned myself with him. I sort of fashioned him skeletally along the same lines as myself as an adolescent. I have pretty severe, no, I won't say borderline severe scoliosis and was in a back brace for many years and have been having to deal with the consequences of that now that I'm an older woman in my 40s. But um, and in that time in my life, in particular, adolescence, growing into what I felt was a body that had turned against me um, was very difficult. And at the same time, it was also when I was going through puberty and like, quote unquote, becoming a woman. And so my experience of becoming a woman was skewed by the tandem experience of growing into a twisted form, growing into a body I didn't want. So I had, I had this feeling like my body is out of my control and it is warped. And at the same time, it is growing breasts and is beginning to menstruate. And these are the things that are going to take my power mm -hmm. away. Uh, because in my experience, I saw femininity, uh, maternity as things that required sacrifice and solicited abuse. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be seen as a human being and as an individual, not as a object or vessel. So I think those ideas were present already just in having conceived of Marek. So when I started thinking about, okay, yes, his mother is, he's told his mother is dead and died in childbirth. She's, she's completely absent. Well, who mothered this mm. boy? I was bringing with me when I tried to answer the question, um, I was bringing with me a feeling that felt angry, resentful, ashamed in a, in a strange sense, ashamed of, of being female, ashamed of having these vulnerabilities or what I perceived to be vulnerabilities. And then I thought of Ina. And I was like, oh, maybe she has a completely different relationship with being a woman mm -hmm. than I do. And maybe there are some gifts that I haven't been able to fully appreciate because I've been so focused on what I've had to suffer through. Not that I think being a woman is an affliction. Mm -hmm. It's just in my personal experience, I haven't had a great time finding peace with that. Probably because of the trauma of having been forced into this orthopedic brace and thinking about my body as, as though it was doing something wrong and, uh, and beyond my control. Um, but anyway, Ina, I loved that Ina 
was you know this 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 woman who as a girl had been betrayed but had survived had lost everything and um did not want to do what women were often sent to do when they had no families or no prospects, which is just go marry Jesus <laughs> Christ and live, a, you know, live in a nunnery and be of service and pray all day. Like that doesn't sound bad <laughs> to me actually, but, um, but man, she, she was, she is, she had some special powers and she mm -hmm. knew it. I think she didn't want that. And, uh, and so, yeah, this idea that she was blind and that actually her maternal ability um, or the, the maternal abilities in her body provided her with special powers, the powers to see, the power to sustain life in others. I mean, those those were sort of these cool, positive and magical attributes that I thought were, you know, for a fiction writer, really kind of juicy. Because when you have a character that can do special things, you, you have this new tool in your toolbox for how to build the story. So, yeah, now Ina can, you know, Ina is in some sense psychic because she she has an ability to communicate with the birds who you know have the ability to see things from high up and overhear conversations and know the truth about things and she also learns from them you know how to use plant medicines where to find water things like that so she became this yeah this sort of magical woman and then I had to think about how to complicate that even further in the story. And that's where it kind of landed for me was when Ina is hired as a midwife to birth the son of God. Uh, I was like, okay, that would be a good job for her. <laughs> well, let me uh, attempt to justify my egregious <laughs> comment before, because Ina is a is a wet nurse. She is, and so she's kind of this unwitting village matriarch. And, uh, you know, in the excerpt that appears in uh, the June issue, Marek, who she described, you know, he was the greediest child she had ever nursed, comes to see her. And just think you described, you know, his body mm -hmm. is crumpled or her torso is crumpled. And it was just such an evocative, familiar, like I immediately knew what she looked mm -hmm. like naked. It's just a weird thing to say. But there's just, they, you know, Marek and Ina come together and they have this sensual experience. But then also you think about that and you think about the other children that she served as a wet nurse for. And she maybe doesn't have that sort of uh, weird sexual thing going on, but she still has this real connection to all of those children yeah. that she nursed and that that intimacy. Yes. Oh yes. Okay, now I get now now I'm remembering why Ina <laughs> has a, a there's a sexy there, there's a sexual element in in especially in terms of her relationship with Marek, yeah. Because at the point that where we meet Marek and he comes to Ina to nurse, she has actually run out of milk. Like she hasn't been able to produce Mm -hmm. breast milk for a long time and um yet there is still the suckling and then there's a kind of transgression or there's some transgressive elements in there um that are you know confusing for the reader because i think you know, we have a tendency to want children to be unsexual, to be innocent. Mm -hmm. um, we have a tendency for old ladies to be non-sexual, have no feelings in their nether regions, etc. And we and we and we mm -hmm. certainly don't want to associate breastfeeding with anything erotic, even though it is 
a pretty common element in sex is like <laughs> nurse like doing the exactly what a baby does when it nurses and you know everyone talks about nipples as these erogenous zones blah 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 so i kind of wanted to just complicate that for the reader in order to complicate the characters maybe to make them a little bit more real and a little bit more dangerous you know talking about kind of subverting elements of society these different things i mean you know you've written in a variety of genres, including, you know, psychological thriller, a mystery, and now uh, Lab Phone, I suppose you could describe as fantastical to a certain degree. I mean, do you think about your work in terms of its genre? I do. Um, I think about genre because there are traditions that I can steal from and use and, and lean up against and play with. A lot of the genres that you just named are, are, you know, genres of books that I don't really think I've ever read. It's just like this vague sense <laughs> of what they sound like. I don't know. I just think that it's, a, I just think that, you know, tone is this ineffable thing that is really captured by the specific style of the language you're using and how you're using it. And um, mm -hmm. that's, I think... On the most basic level, that's what builds up a system of imagination in the reader. Uh, you can pile on as much information and details as you, you can, um, but the way that those images and ideas are being processed uh, in the reader's mind could add up to something very different if you're not also allowing the tone and and a system of perception um, to grow in, in the reader as well. You have to tell them how to take all this in. And that is the magic of, you know, writing in distinctive ways. Um, you know, there are a lot of ways to say, uh, the say the same thing. Like the opening for Lapona is the bandits came again on Easter. And mm -hmm. you know, if it was a very different book, I, I could say something like, it was Easter and something terrible happened. You wouldn't believe it. It was the mm -hmm. worst thing that could happen on, on a holiday. I mean, now we're in a really different book, you know? Um, right. <laughs> Yeah, and it gets it, it. It's funny because sometimes I think it's really like the mood that I'm in. Like I, when I'm writing, I have to be in the right <laughs> mood to know how to write. You know, <laughs> I can't. And then, and that's part of the challenge of like working on multiple things at the same time. Is you get a little bit like multiple personalities, being like, okay, now I'm this mood, and I have to write in this tone. Now I have to go back and and be this person inhabiting this mind and, you know, using this voice. Um, it's a bit of a, it's sort of like acting. And I, and I think about um, when my sister studied acting um, at Strasbourg in New York when I was in my twenties and you know, she had some sort of like method acting books lying around. And I think those have made an impression on me. Um, and I went and observed her class once and it was really cool. It's like everybody was just sort of practicing all at the same time on stage. There was a girl who for like 45 minutes was being a lion on her hands and knees and like breathing really heavy and like moving her body in a certain way and like really, really getting into it. And I'll never forget it because that's, that's really how, how I feel like I, I need to work too is totally be possessed and work hard to allow myself to be possessed um, of the spirit of the book um, so that I don't do things like make mistakes in, in tone. And, and when I feel like you've written really authoritatively in a specific world, 
with a specific tone, the places where you push against that can take on very deliberate meaning. Like in Lapvona, there are some conversations between characters that I was like, oh, this is a place where I can get this married couple to bicker exactly like the way I bicker with my husband. And it can feel really contemporary and it will make sense because we're hearing it from an older generation's point of view. Anyway, you know, things like that where you could start you, you could start to play with the tone. I think that's where a lot of comedy comes up from. The style is a little looser. And again, the, the tone that you're kind of setting out to create uh, that tension. There is comedy from that tension between the sort of the, the rigor uh, of society and how people actual real people have to exist within that uh, mm -hmm. framework. And also, you know, you know, get busy with your former <laughs> wet nurse. Um, but <laughs> I, I guess, you know, you were talking about multiple projects. Uh, what's next for you? Oh, man, I've been I've been working on some nonfiction stuff. Um, not about me, it's about about other people. <clears throat> I have been working on the same short story for about two years, very, very slowly. Um, I've been working on scripts for films and that's been mm. a big part of my creative life in the last three or four years. Do you find it hard to sort of be as communicative in the screenwriting format as you are in say, you know, a short story or, you know, longer fiction? Well, yes, in a way. And I, I don't feel as much as I do an individual in screenwriting than I do in prose. I mean, I do see scripts as works of literature. I mean, you read read Taxi Driver. Um, it is an amazing book, you know? <laughs> it is absolutely mm -hmm. stunning. I mean, actually, all of his scripts are stunning. But, um, and so I, it's not that I don't think that the the way that you write is very, very important, but it's something that's written uh, as part of a process where the script itself is not the end goal. Right. And so it has to be very, very specific. And, you know, I'd say it's, oh, there are some things from the short story that feel true about screenwriting and that's the economy the details, dialogue, and world building in a very efficient and effective way so that you're not reading a script for 30 pages before you understand where you are and how this world works. You know, that needs to be apparent from the first lines of description. Well... Thank you so much. This was really lovely speaking with you. You've been listening to the Harper's Podcast. The music is cut and shoot by Febrifuge. The New York Times called Harper's America's most interesting magazine. Receive elegant, insightful, and wry writing from the best journalists, essayists, critics, novelists, and poets every month in our print magazine and gain access to our digital archive, which stretches back to 1850. Visit harpers.org save to subscribe for only $16.97.